Shall I read the Tenth Amendment? I got it. I got it. Okay. The, the, the Tenth Amendment is going to say that uh, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited, prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. States' rights. So, yeah, we, we, we spoke about last week the Ninth Amendment and how that it tells us that there are inherent rights that are not included in the Bill of Rights that are still just as important as those that are, are enumerated. Okay, those that are placed within the Constitution or the Bill of Rights itself. That makes sense? Absolutely. And so this Tenth Amendment is going to tell us that there are rights that are reserved by the states and others that are, are reserved by the people. Okay, but it's just really letting the states know that they are still sovereign. They're the ones who are still going to have powers and rights and things that are available that were not otherwise given in the Constitution. And I remember this was a, a big deal uh, in the day, and there's been just absolutely tons of litigation right from the beginning, right, right out the gate, uh, involving the Tenth Amendment and what it actually means. And uh, it stems from everything from the Bill of Rights to... Um, Articles, specific articles and clauses and sections within the Constitution itself, primarily the uh, Necessary and Proper Clause, the Commerce Clause, uh, taxing, right, the right to power to tax, uh, as well as just to borrow money, the right to, uh, almost everything that Congress has done at some point has been an issue <laughs> as to whether or not they can regulate the states. And it's simply going to be too much to talk about today. Um, we're not even going to come close. But I, I think maybe just to give an overview and to kind of wrap things up, I wanted to start with Justice John Marshall, okay, who is uh, maybe Robert Jackson, Justice Jackson, maybe my first... And most favorite justice, but uh, John Marshall is definitely in my top three, and he was the first Chief Justice, really, of 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 the United States Supreme Court, and um, it just I, it's not because he wrote some of the first opinions; it's because some of his opinions uh, have withstood the test of time, and still today are as uh, relevant as they were when he wrote them. And the powers... It's like classic rock and roll, right? Yeah. And, it's old. and and two opinions that, uh, I mean, everybody should at least read one time, uh, probably, is um, Marbury versus Madison and McCulloch versus Maryland. And, but, oh, by the way, I want to go on, I want to go on a little t tangent here. It has nothing to do with the Tenth Amendment, uh -oh. but... Um, has anything to do with me? No, I, okay. but I want to. go ahead. I want to. I want to point out. Uh, there's been some, in some hypothetical cases, hypothetical cases that I'm working on right now. Um, problems with the statutory rape law, okay, and, and I know this has nothing to do with the tenth, but I feel like this is great. Um, be careful about criticizing that, especially when we're talking about teenage kids when when it involves maybe a 18 year old and a 13, 14 year old, 19, 13, 14 year old. I realize there's going to be um, some complaints. I realize that, and you may not absolutely agree with me. But consider this Justice Marshall was 27 years old when he married, okay? Miss Polly Ambler, which is Mary Ambler, who was 16. You, and they were dating. He fell in love with her call when, she was, yes. when she was... When she... I'm going to finish this whole thing. Yes. When she was 13. Those are different times. Oh, they were. So in 200 years, we've evolved already to... That kind of human emotion would be the fastest evolution that I've ever seen. Right? And these were highly educated and prominent people. Look, if you look back at the time that that happened, I got no problems with that at all. I understand the way it works. The way society has built it up now, you're condemned. You could have, you could have, if you had mental, uh, 
adulthood at earlier ages, we might be able to continue this on, but the, the way a majority of people are, their, their um, maturity levels are not there, man. You can't handle that kind of stuff anymore. Man, I don't know. I don't see how some of that changes in two well, years. Saying, go. Now, what I'm saying, though, is if you got an uh, 18-year-old and a 16-year-old and we're having issues there, I got challenges with that because that's just young love. But when you start going below that, it starts making me feel creepy. We got a call. Welcome to the show. This is Matt. Who are you? Hi, Matt. This is Steve Young, and I'm just calling in to tell you and Benton that I really like the show. I listen to it all the time, and uh, <laughs> I uh, think this is a great service you do for the county and the community, and I'm just calling to say thank you both. Wow, it's, thank you very th much. Thank you, Judge, for just trying to, trying to meet your standards, man. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that well, very I, much. I want, I want the county to know that Benton Watson did a marvelous job with our food court competition. He did a great uh, service by tutoring the kids and then serving as a judge. And clearly, he was one of our best judges. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judge. Appreciate Thank you, Judge. Much. And I'm not call running. anytime. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> running for office, by the way. I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, well, yeah. So there's that. There's there's that. And uh, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to offend too many people. But I would like to offend you enough to make you think about that. And that not all of these happen because they're nasty cases it sometimes it's puppy love just i mean it can be that and i get that and that's great that's great and, and so just, 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 I just read a story keep about that those, in mind I just read a story about those child molesters and it, it makes it when you read a story like that about child molesters that's what makes you protect the child even more so it's because you're inundated with all these creeps out there doing stuff to children it, it, it sickens me man that's one of those things i will I'll lose it. If I'm I not talking it. about a. I'm not talking about that. No, I understand it, but what I'm saying is because that is so prominent and people hear that there's so much wanting to protect the children that that concept you just talked about, puppy love, it kind of gets blocked by all these weirdos and perverts messing with children. So just uh, just remember that. Anyway, for my hypothetical cases, maybe in the future. Anyway, so Marbury versus Madison. I I've run out of time now, but. It, it's got to start there because one of my favorite quotes in a court of law oftentimes to the judge is not guilty. It, yeah, well, no, no, that's what I, that's a response that I love. Okay. But it, it's it's judge an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. It's void. It's it's non effective. It cannot do it. OK. And. That's what he said, and he said it is the province and duty of the judicial department uh, to decide what the law is in the regard when we're talking about the Constitution. And so we had to start there because that sets the stage. And what Marbury versus Madison was just uh, just briefly is uh, John Adams issued a bunch of commissions uh, before Jefferson came into office, you know, Federalist, Anti-Federalist. And when he came into office... Uh, he told James Madison not to issue the commissions to the justice of the pieces, okay, that were appointed by John Adams. And it's because they were political enemies, right? It was it was Federalist, anti Federalist. Wait, but what do you call what do you call a uh, judge of the peace? Multiple. Judge of pieces? What? <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. No, justice of the peace. Okay. But what do but, you have? Yeah, yeah, no, have, I don't know. What do you have a few in the room? You go justice of the pieces? He, he, he appointed multiple justice okay. of the pieces. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, probably. We probably messed it up. <laughs> Magistrates. <laughs> uh, so, Judge, so, call in. Tell us what. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Kincaid, so with that. Kincaid's looking it up for us. Oh, tell us. And then, and then, um, hold, what hold, is hold, it? Kincaid, uh, tell us what we got. Um, and, and more general, uh, commonly used context, the plural form of justice is justice. In some contexts, it'll be justices. Not so we just, say justices justice of the peace? Yeah, okay, I mean, I've heard sense. that before, so I mean, that's most probable. Not I, I, like, I like justice of the pieces. <laughs> 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 so, and then he didn't issue the commissions, and so then Marbury, you know, Judge Justice... Justice of the Peace, Marbury was upset, and so he went after him, and it was a big political controversy. And and if you read the opinion and read the history on it, 
Justice Marshall just did an outstanding job of, 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 of balancing the two. He, he made Marbury lose, but he gave the judiciary more power, and he also interpreted the Constitution at the same time so he could make everybody happy, but also advance the power of the court. And, I mean, it was a very, very strategic decision that goes next in that just sets the stage from McCulloch versus Maryland. And you remember, right after the founding, you want to say all this was great and everything was going good, Dude, it was it was hard, right? There was it was uh, depressions that were going on, taxes being laid. You had a you had remember the the Articles of Confederation, remember that? And so it was really just thirteen states trying to figure out what to do, and 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 they had no funding. They had they had uh, enforcement problems. They had no real leadership. There was no real president, even though they were they were claimed to be. There there was it was hard for them to take action. Remember there was Shays Rebellion, and Shays Rebellion came because there was a, a depression. There was taxes. Uh, it was. It, they almost felt like if you were poor, if you were poor in agricultural uh, businesses, you, you, you almost felt like you're still under the rule of England because that you know these debt collectors, ta tax collectors, would go to court, get judgments, and started seizing land. And people, you remember, people were in the revolution. People were in these armies, and so they didn't have time to make a lot of money, and so they're already in debt. Because and when they get out and then there was no wages being paid because we had a problem we didn't have a centralized government, okay and so we couldn't force people to have money. It was hard to tax. It was hard to get money to pay the soldiers and so that that just exacerbated the problem and then it just became more exacerbated by more regulations and people trying to get paid. They were trying to get their money so when people wouldn't pay they would go execute seize their land, okay and. It, and the and the small uh, rural farmers just felt like they were being taken advantage of, and the prominent people, the you know, like they were getting under. The, yeah, exactly. That was a great that was a great <laughs> pun there, but but they were felt like George Washington and all the other framers, right, were doing great, and that they and they were just helping them, even though they didn't. A lot of the framers, a lot of the people that signed the Constitution, died and lost everything. You know, I want to okay. tell you something about George. I was reading a letter. He was. Uh, talking to his officers because they were kind of wanting to revolt because they weren't getting paid. And he goes up there and talks to his officers. He takes off his glasses. He says, excuse me, my age is getting to me because they, they adored this man. And he asked them to just hold on a little bit longer because I know you're not getting paid, but we just went through a, a, a great revolution here. We're free now. Let's not lose it at this point. And it's just amazing when you think about that and hear stories like that, what it took to get this country the way it is. It took men like that, men and women back then of honorable... Um, stature to, to just hold strong, stay strong, and make us where we are today. So appreciate what you got out there, ladies and gentlemen. It's a it's a miracle. It's a miracle about this country. And and us us. So all of that is true. And, and it, I just don't I just don't want. I hate when people have the impression that after we went through the revolution, it was all hunky dory. Oh, yeah. uh, and there and, and the founding fathers, the ones that give us our Bill of Rights, even Patrick Henry, right, has to do things. That are just totally against his nature, like uh, that. In in, in other, for Shays Rebellion, uh, one of the Adams uh, suspends habeas corpus, right? They suspend certain rights. They they actually uh, make the legislative acts that were done already by people that were uh, uh, helpful to the rebellion. They made that null and void. They they started uh, going after people who were speaking out against the government. These were American. These were these were Americans doing this, not England. Mm -hmm. Okay, and because it was there was so t t turmoil going on at the time, nobody knew what to do, and not having a centralized government made it worse. And and so that's how we get get to where we are trying to establish a constitution. Okay, now with that being said, we flash forward up into you know the you know eighteen fifteen around this time. Okay, and we have McCulloch versus Maryland, and what had happened is, is that it, the federal government uh, made a corporate bank that was able to lend, invest, loan, borrow, um, and deposit federal monies, but it was controlled by private stockholders, and this bank could issue notes, issue its own notes, right, as well as the notes that were issued by state banks as legal currency, as tender, as legal tender. Okay, and in exchange for that, that bank 
right, loaned the United States money, a, a, a ton of money. Yep. Okay, and so this upset everybody, and it especially upset everybody because there was a depression. Okay, and the state banks were really upset as well because they they couldn't do the same. They didn't have the same kind of power, right? And it allowed them basically not to have a steady flow of income. And so when the depression hit, a lot of the banks and banks failed. Okay, a lot of the banks failed. They blamed their failure on the federal bank. Okay, and so in retaliation or just to save themselves, a lot of states started taxing these federal banks, the branches of the federal bank. And that's what we have. We have Maryland taxing, right, the bank, and then they go, and the bank's not paying. The bank's refusing to pay. It's a federal bank. It's not paying. And so they sue. And that's where we get McCulloch, who was the cashier of the bank. Okay, and so it, it goes, and of course they lose in the state courts. They appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Justice John Marshall's got to hear the case. And the reason you, you'll see why I told you about the Articles of Confederation. So in this case, Justice Marshall has got a tough decision to make again politically. And this, this decision right here is probably the most seminal uh, case that we've got and is the most powerful case out of any right, to establish a national power, and a lot of people hate this opinion, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle ground, I, it was necessary in some regards, and yeah, it gives a lot, it gives the national government a lot of power, and, but it's a beautiful, it's a beautifully written opinion, and it's powerful, it's just strong, and it's, it's great to read, and, uh, I, so the necessary and proper clause allows the government to enact laws that are necessary and proper to carry out its other powers and the people that were going against the banks they were they were arguing against the bank says no if the if there's no power in the constitution there's nothing in the constitution that says that the the leg, the congress has a right to corporate make some kind of corporation nor does it have a right to establish a bank and remember if it's not delegated if it's not delegated to the Congress, mm -hmm. then it's reserved to the states. states. That's right. Well, that's a good argument. So Justice Marshall goes back and look at the Articles of Confederation, and in the Articles, it was a similar language in there that said the 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 powers not given right to this confederation right are retained by the states mm -hmm. are expressly are are that, that are not expressly delegated right to this confederation are retained by the states expressly and so justice marshall said well the framers were part of the articles of confederation and so they had to be aware of that and the whole point of making this new document the constitution was because the articles of confederation failed in so many aspects and so we needed a new document and they knew what they were doing in the Tenth Amendment when they did not put expressly, okay, in the Tenth Amendment. So, when we go look at the Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So, Marshall was saying the powers not expressly delegated versus the powers not delegated. Say that again. Justice Marshall said, if we only meant those powers mm -hmm. that were expressly said in the Constitution, meaning the actual printed word. He keeps saying expressly. I just want to make sure there's a clear definition. It's explicitly, clearly. Clearly stated. Clearly stated. Okay. Okay. Not implicitly, not implied. Okay. Clearly stated. Which is what we talked about in the First Amendment, in the Tenth Amendment, in the Third and Ninth. Right, is that there's these implied rights? Well, there's that doesn't apply from the other way around, is what the people arguing against the banks say. So Marshall says no, because the Articles of Confederation said that those powers not expressly delegated. This one only says the powers not delegated. So there must be more powers delegated to the that's national right, that's government. Right, that's right. That are implied. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, I keep telling you in my classes, words mean, mean things. Mean things. Words mean, mean things. things. And that's why I gave this story. I want to... Who... I mean... Because you could read this. It's just like the uh, the verses in the Bible. You read a verse in the Bible and it's like, okay, 
No, 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 no. Read it again. Because <laughs> that word means something. That comma means something. The line before it and the verse before it means something. What you're saying here in those key words, they mean things. Because if you say one word, it means, yeah, we're talking about these few, not those, which means there are more. That's exactly. And so the, that means that anything that was necessary and proper within the commerce power, the taxing power, the, the, the money and loaning and borrowing powers of Congress went into the manner in which they could do it. So they didn't all, it, it, if, we had to, if we had to put in everything, we're making a code, not a constitution. And he said, this is a constitution. We're not spelling out every single manner in which Congress can enact what it needs to do under its constitutional powers, which I agree with that portion. He goes farther, though, in several aspects that gives great power to the national government, and that's what gave rise to the Commerce Clause. I think you saw an email I sent to a guy uh, a few weeks ago uh, explaining some, some gun rights, yep. and, and I explained to him to be very careful right, on a couple of areas in regard to the, the Commerce Clause, and remember how that can be interpreted. So what is interstate commerce? What is commerce? What affects commerce? I mean, uh, there, Rick was you talking could, about that too. Rick was talking about how that can get so convoluted there. I mean, you can almost, I mean, at some level, you can almost argue anything mm -hmm. it, it affects it. And remember, I spoke about the, the flatulence, cattle flatulence. Yeah, I remember. Okay, about how <laughs> the, stank, about how the uh, methane gas that's produced from cattle farts, okay, it comes together and creates greenhouse gases and how some uh, of this affects the weather and then how combined this, the, the weather affects right industry and how industry affects how the products are produced so and so that, eventually right it is uh, eventually we get to the point where it's affecting the whole interstate commerce so fast food is behind global warming yeah <laughs> okay. okay and 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 then how we had the wheat the 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 crop producer who uh, never sold any wheat or used any wheat or any crops That's what off of his property yeah, yeah, yeah. he never used anything off his property all he used it to do was feed his chickens but he was so many acres over, half a dozen or a dozen acres over of whatever this wheat act was. And so they came in and, and penalized him. And he said, what are you, t under the, under basically interstate commerce, what are you talking about? I don't, it, I don't, I don't even sell my wheat. It don't, I don't even leave my property. I don't have anything. Well, Congress said that that fell within Right, certain powers that could be regulated as part of commerce, interstate commerce. Now, they wrote those powers for specific um, grotesqueness, grotesqueness of it. Where's the common sense part of it where they go, okay, it wasn't really designed for you, the guy who went a little bit over. It's meant for um, people doing it on a mass scale, right? Where does the common sense part of it come in? Well, it didn't. That was a Supreme Court case I just talked to you about, about the wheat grower. And so, um, and that's a famous one, actually, a very famous case. And so, I mean, this just goes to show this is how this is how the Commerce Clause has reacted. And this this has led to other opinions like United. Uh, but the court has not always upheld these things. And there's several elements. And remember, I spoke about a case right before at the end or the first of the year about uh, how there was some religious rights and how it had to be proportional and congruent that goes into these. Okay, but I was going to point out before I got went off here today that this has led to um, um, uh, the court not giving. The Tenth Amendment has helped uh, restrict federal power in the cases of United States versus Lopez, which was a statute that prohibited possession of a gun at or near a school. Mm -hmm. Okay, man, there's all those school zone provisions in the unlawful carry within right. the federal, and, and the, the court said, man... That was, I think it was a 1995 opinion. Man, that, that's criminal law, and that's really local. I mean, why are you guys trying to regulate? Why is the federal government putting its hand into regulating local school zoning? And so the, a lot of times the federal government sees itself having problems when it starts regulating gun, gun control as well as criminal law, and, and really and when it starts to try to regulate land use, right, as well as local how do i say this local activity not necessarily products but local activity and and that's why it has a problem with with gun control issues and uh criminal laws and land use regulations and another big one oh there was a violence against women act that they tried to they tried to give that was also um 
seem unconstitutional, but Prince. Prince versus United States with the 97 opinion. And I thought you might have even heard of this one because it's the Brady Handgun Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Violence Protection Act, okay? And this was the big one. This was saying the federal government cannot commandeer, commandeer, right, states to do certain things and in that case for instance this was the nick's background check mm -hmm. the brady bill actually required originally um for local law enforcement officers to do all of the background checks okay and the sheriffs i think it was uh, jay prince and richard mack one sheriff from montana the other one from arizona we sued. had richard mack on the show one time so, he's a good guy yeah sued sued to uh Require because the government was trying to make local law enforcement. He said, well, "This is not something you can require us to do." Are you crazy? And that's what the the Supreme Court said. It it, it uh, held that Congress could not circumvent the prohibition on commandeering a state's regulatory process by conscripting, and they even said drafting the state's police officers right into the federal regime. They couldn't draft. Okay, the, the local, I love that term, and they said the federal government may neither issue directives requiring the state to address political particular problems, nor command the state officers to administer or enforce federal regulatory programs. It matters not whether policy making is involved, and no case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. You know, They're fundamentally incompatible I don't know with the should, Constitution. I don't know if I should say this or not. Forgive me if I'm screwing something up, but Chris White, our sheriff... I think I heard him one time say he would never, he would never follow those confiscation laws of anything that comes down. So Chris, if you're listening, and if I hope I didn't put my foot in my mouth, but if you want to call in, go ahead. But I mean, that's good to know where the, the main law enforcement officer in this county, Chris White, would not go for those types of things of confiscating gun laws because it's like here, leave us alone. We'll deal with it in our own manner. You know? And and so yeah, and that you 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 essentially wrapped it up with a with a nice example of exactly yeah. what what that gives local leaders a right to do when it tries to right be a bureaucratic regulatory regime from on a national scale right you can't control us on a local basis as far as for local matters does that make sense makes sense to me. and you can't and you can't require state officers to enforce that regulatory regime i have a feeling i know who this is we got a call coming to see this for us. Um, Ross, I don't know about you, but Would you like to come on the show? I've totally enjoyed All right, I'll these um, amendments going over them in detail. Kincaid, who we got? Chris White. That's what I thought. Chris, I had a hunch you'd be listening. Welcome to the show, Sheriff Hello. White. How's it going? I think you lost him. Is he on now? No, no, I, I got to connect him now. Right, stand by. Stand by. Here we go. Sheriff White, how you doing? Hey, how are you doing, man? Pretty good. I, I was. I hope I didn't stick my foot in my mouth, but I think that's the way no, you believe. No, absolutely. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't support any kind of a, of a confiscation law. I mean, that's just. That just goes against our Second Amendment, which, which is uh, we hold very dear. You know? you know, I don't think a lot of people really realize the power you hold, Sheriff, is because you're the man in the county. Now, you can push out the feds if you want to, if I understand my <laughs> my laws right. And uh, that's a powerful thing to do, and that's it puts a lot of um, responsibility on your shoulders. So I'm glad to hear that you support that and you need to think about doing that in, a, in an over aggressive way. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously we can see that uh, politics is a, is a dirty business when it's up there. On the <laughs> side, but, uh, I mean, we're just trying to keep it real here in Montana. That's awesome. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for calling. If you got something else you want to talk about, feel free to do so. But I appreciate you clarifying and supporting what I said about the way you act. So I appreciate that. No, absolutely. And, and yeah, huge shout out to Ross. And uh, yeah, I may not always uh, agree with Ross, but, uh, but man, they did a great job. They did a great job on the, uh, on the moot court competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Sheriff. I appreciate all the work you do, man. <laughs> all right, man. Thank you. Right, yes, sir. Thanks. All right. You want to wrap this up here, Ross? Yeah, uh, I, I hope that uh, it was all informative, and I hope that you guys are more educated about the, the Bill of Rights, and it was just a privilege and a and joy being here throughout all this. And uh, just remember a, an act of Congress that is repugnant to the Constitution. Any of those Bill of Rights is void. Void.
Tell everybody what you do. And once again, this long, this extended segment is sponsored by Coupling the Dodd Crib Law Firm. And I'll tell you what, I've known Rick a long time. And for some reason, he likes me. Why? I don't know. <laughs> and I asked him that. And he goes, I haven't figured it out yet. So I'm not going to, hopefully he doesn't figure it out. But I want to thank him very much for supporting the program like I do with all my other sponsors. Without them, I could not be on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you, without sponsors, this show doesn't happen. And the sponsors do it because they trust in me, they believe in what we're doing here, and I ask that you please go support these sponsors. Because without your support, you know, the show doesn't stay on the air. Yeah. Okay, tell, tell everybody what you and, do. Yeah, yeah. So if you need to get in contact with me about the show, about questions, man, we love that. We get a lot of these. Email me at Benton at Watson.legal. That is Benton at Watson. Dot legal again if you got something please email me we, we always try to respond and we do respond to most people but if you do send me an email please uh put your number on there and if you want to call me you can uh call me at 254-605-4140 254-605-4140 or come see me at 105 east main street here in cameron Right across the street from the courthouse, big milk cow on the side you can't miss it. There you go. And respectforyou.com. And thank you, uh, Judge and Sheriff and Rick Dodd for everything.